Welcome back to the podcast. In our last episode, we had to say goodbye to Samuel D. Champlain. But now we find ourselves back in Acadia, the place where he first landed in New France. While Champlain and others had abandoned the colony, there were associates of his who still saw opportunity. Chief among them was Baron Poutrincourt. Poutrincourt was a member of nobility, of course, but he had very little actual wealth to his name, an odd position to be in. And he had participated in de Mont's uh, Port Royal Colony, along with Champlain and many of the other names you've heard before. And as we already know, he already purchased the rights to Port Royal from de Mont. So at this point, Acadia is his to risk and his to gain. Now we know de Mont depopulated Port Royal in 1607. Of course, some Frenchmen stayed behind because they had already found native wives. This is going to happen everywhere uh, we learn about the French. And Poutrincourt had gone to the King of France with all of the things he had grown at Port Royal. And he said, look, we can do some good farming here. There's potential for profit, prosperity. And the king extended his monopoly over the area for one additional year without consulting de Mont and his various rights over the area. At a certain point, this would be followed up by a formal grant where Poutrincourt would have rights to the area without ever having to go through de Mont, where previously de Mont's title was the superior one and Poutrincourt a seemingly a license within it. I know that's a, a complicated thing, but basically de Mont was like the viceroy of New France, where Poutrincourt would be a local a feudal lord over a portion of New France. Not the best way to start this episode with this confusing discussion, but I'm over it. Anyway, when Port Royal was abandoned in 1607, the great member too, the 100-year-old chief of the Mi'kmaq people, told his friends, the French, that he would look after their colony while the French were gone, hoping that they would return. In 1608, a company ship is sent by to check out the colony, and just as member two had promised, the crops were growing, the houses were being kept up, Perhaps he wasn't 100 years old, perhaps he wasn't the paramount chief of all of the Mi'kmaq, but he certainly was true to his word, and he kept everything going. By 1609, Poutrincourt had in mind an agricultural community under his direct control, and in 1609, Poutrincourt gained the right to collect fees on the French ships moving in and out of Acadia. And to collect these fees, he had his own son, who we call Bayancourt, just to separate the two, receive the title of Vice Admiral to New France. Now, why would this scheme work? Well, as it turns out, Acadia, in the time we're talking about and decades afterward, would be the further outposts of all these different fishing and fur trading operations that we saw the French undertake in what is now Newfoundland, Labrador, and Nova Scotia. They made their way down the coast. And so the history of Acadia is often full of not one man with a central idea and a central plan like Champlain, but like we see in this case, where we see a hodgepodge of different French outfits operating summer colonies, essentially, or small year-round outposts where the trade is mostly clandestine, where there's some larger figure who has a title to everything, and he swoops around every year to collect tribute, almost in the Native American fashion. In this capacity, Poutrincourt and his son Bayancourt would be the dictators of Acadia, the autocrats. They would be the sole source of official power from France. Now, the Jesuits wanted to take a bite of that. And so as Bayancourt and Poutrincourt were preparing to resettle Acadia, the Jesuit order was lobbying to start conversion efforts in Acadia. But with that came the power of the Catholic Church in the assumed fashion that it had back in old France. This isn't just a couple of priests who are going to step off a boat and then worry about spiritual matters. The priesthood were used to being part of the government. They would have a say, in other words. Poutrincourt was also suspicious of the Jesuits, as many were in France at this time, because they were associated with the Iberian powers, the Spanish and the Portuguese, who were rivals to many of the colonial endeavors of the French. So rather be seen as members of this universal Catholic Church, some viewed the Jesuits as agents of foreign powers. And so while Poutrincourt, at least on the surface, agreed to take Jesuits with him, in February of 1610, he slipped out of port and made his way to Acadia without them. It wasn't an easy crossing, and he had to put down a mutiny, which he handled easily, because the people he brought with them were mostly close confidants 
and longtime collaborators like the Latour family. Now, Claude Latour, he came along and brought his son Charles. Charles will be very important to the next episode in this series. Paltrincourt also brought along his own priest, not of any particular order. And this priest was tasked with converting as many natives as he possibly could, as fast as he possibly could, to prove to France, the royal court, and to the Jesuits that the Jesuits were not needed in Acadia. We were getting along just fine with uh, spreading the word of Jesus. And so much to their relief, as previous ships had demonstrated, when Paltrincourt shows up, Member 2 shows up to meet him right at Port Royal. Kept everything going once again for another season. And at this point in time, the priest and Paltrincourt's son, Bayancourt, would spend an intense amount of time trying to very quickly learn the Mi'kmaq language. And at the first chance they could, they baptized Member 2. And he took on the first name Henri. Henri Member 2. 20 others of his family were converted with him. And the historian Francis Parkman writes that under pain of death and war, he would force the conversions of all the nearby peoples. This would be a pivotal moment for the Mi'kmaq people, many of them believing that Member 2 was a grand chief and so would have the authority to make his people officially Catholic. And so this could be used to their advantage in all the dealings with New France moving forward that they were united as brothers in faith. Of course, there are those who argue that Member 2 was just a local chief and that this entire event had been aggrandized both for Paltrincourt's purposes of showing how successful his conversions were and for later generations of the Mi'kmaq people navigating a colonial world that would look to push them aside if not for these special connections. One curious bit here is that Member 2 only brought 20 people to be converted with him. Wouldn't it be more if he was the Grand Chief? I don't know. Let's play the other side and say, because they were his family, it was the ruling class of the entire nation. So as soon as that was done in July of 1610, Bayancourt is sent back to France with a register of all the people who were converted. And along with the regular business of the colony, this was to keep the Catholic Church at bay, and especially the Jesuits, out of his business. That being done, Bayancourt very quickly returned to the colony well before the end of the year. Because now he had to handle the task of collecting fees from all these various independent operations in the area, or dismantling them completely if they didn't agree to his terms. And one of the first operations Bayancourt comes across is operated by none other than Robert Pontgrave, the son of Grave Dupont who we learned about when we discussed Champlain. And right at this time, he would be in the St. Lawrence, helping to build Quebec. But his son was still hobnobbing around Acadia, participating in the fur trade without any sort of license from Demont, from Paltrincourt, permission from Bayancourt, nobody. Apparently, he got into it with a lot of the different native groups. He kidnapped an Etchemin girl once, and then had to take refuge among the Etchemin's enemies, Paltrincourt and Bayancourt, Having heard of this and being allies to the Etchemin, Robert Pontgrave then organized a sort of anti-French coalition of natives against Poutrincourt. And the tension was only released with the capture of Robert Pontgrave himself, who would ultimately be pardoned, probably because of his family connections and his connections among the natives, and thereafter paid whatever fees and rules he had to follow. Although this shady character would always remain suspect. Anytime the Poutrincourt family had trouble asserting their authority, among other trading outfits of the French and the natives. Having settled all this, Bayancourt again returns to France to report to the king himself. But, unknown to him, the year before, after he left, in 1610, Henri IV was assassinated by a Catholic zealot. This left his wife, Marie de Medici, the mother to the infant king, in charge of France. This would mean trouble. Francis Parkman wrote on Marie, a coarse scion of bad stock, false wife and faithless queen, paramour of intrigue, foreigner, tool of the Jesuits, and of Spain, was regent in the minority of her imbecile son. With the great enlightened Henri IV now dead, the ruler of France, for all intents and purposes, I know I love saying that, is viewed by some as a Spanish pawn. Bayancourt learned of the new order and the assassination when he returned to France, he also learned that all of the Huguenot investors, so the French Protestant investors in Poutrincourt's colony, had been bought out by a wealthy member of the aristocracy named Madame Gertreville, a woman in her youth so chaste and morally upright that when King Henri IV came to her house 
looking for a little company. She gave him her bedroom, and she left, acknowledging that the king is the king everywhere he goes, but that she would prefer to be in charge of her household. And so she herself would go to another house. A staunch Catholic, she was making all of these purchases for the use of the Jesuits. Now Biancor has to heed the new order. He agrees to take Jesuits with him. And this is during the very same time where he's finally awarded the Vice Admiral of the Seas of New France. That's his official title. And so with cooperation comes reward. But coupling the madam's purchases on behalf of the Jesuits with the new ruler of France, who is very pro-Jesuit, and then the two Jesuits that Biancourt takes with him back to Acadia, this amounts to Poutrincourt now having to share authority. So he probably wasn't too happy to see his son at this point in time. Both on a governmental level and then on a proprietor level, the Jesuits were now in Acadia. And as Poutrincourt feared, they would slowly assert themselves and take over more and more of the operations. And so after Biancourt shows up with these guys, Poutrincourt agrees to just sell outright his rights to Acadia to his son and be done with it. Not that he had a lot of faith in his son either. It seems like he wanted to cut his losses at this point. Very same year, 1611, Biancourt abuses a native woman. And then Biancourt is so scared of his father, like a child, he runs away. One of the Jesuits he brought, Father Biard, he catches him. He literally catches Biancourt and he gets Poutrincourt to forgive him. And then the son would spend the remainder of the year trolling the coast for all the different French fishing operations and fur trading posts in order to exact tribute. And it is at this point in time that Pont Grave's own wayward son, as I mentioned earlier, is actually caught. Just to feed that little digression back into the main story. And so now we say goodbye to Poutrincourt as he abandons his colony to his young son, having absolutely no hope of his son succeeding at all because of the treachery of the Jesuits. Father Biard, one of the Jesuits that Biancourt was forced to take to Acadia, had a hard time converting the natives, even though many of the natives had already, at least on paper, been converted. He couldn't find a way to relate Christian ideas, Catholic ideas, to the native culture, and he didn't really have a knack for the languages. And on the home front, the two Jesuits were simply not getting along with Biancourt or many of the other French in the colony, who were not very religiously minded. At a certain point, the Jesuits announced that they will be returning to France. Biancourt simply could not allow this to happen, because their testimonies would flavor the view that France has over Biancourt's operations, and it wasn't going to be a good one. So Biancourt says, no, 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 no. You two Jesuits, you have to stay here, because I, I was tasked with your safety, and so you must stay around me, so I could be sure to keep you safe. Of course the Jesuits weren't going to fall for this, and they immediately excommunicate Biancourt, the great member too, always in the know, and his son hear about this, and his son actually offers Biancourt uh, to kill the Jesuits. He says, I'll, I'll take them out for you. Biancourt, of course, refuses, but now the Jesuits are horrified of what's going on here, and so they try to get back to France however they can, and we find that they're running away from Port Royal. Ultimately, they want to find a fishing vessel of French origin or some friendly nation to get themselves hopefully back to France, but at least far, far away from Port Royal. Biancourt takes it so far as to actually capture the Jesuits and drag them back. But eventually, the madam heard word of what was going on, and she pulled all of her funding that was intended to infuse Port Royal. And now she began to plan her own colony in Acadia. She went through the process of buying up any leftover rights that DeMaul might have, buying anything that Poutrincourt might have laying around, and essentially she was boxing out Biancourt. Furthermore, they seized the cargo that came from Port Royal that ended up in France, the Jesuits took into their possession, claiming damages on Poutrincourt's estate through the actions of his son. So now suddenly there's litigation, conflict everywhere, everything's falling apart, the madam will go on to make her own colony. But Biancourt still has some things on his side. He's able to collect those licenses for the different operations in Acadia. And moving into the year 1613, Biancourt builds a large trading post that becomes a fort, essentially, with a small community around it. And this becomes the first permanent European settlement in New England. And it's not even English. Of course, many years later, it will be taken over by the men from Plymouth, but we're not going to talk about that right now. And so let's turn to the Madam's Colony. She decided to use all of her funds that were available and all of her privileges that she had attained from the various parties we've talked about 
to create a colony for the Jesuits, run by the Jesuits, governed by the Jesuits, with the explicit purpose of converting natives, saving souls. And in return, she was asking for nothing. The Jesuits would support themselves on the fur trade with the natives, perhaps limiting themselves to this activity to avoid having to pay a license to buy in core. The colony will be known by many different names in the history books. Sometimes you just see the Madame's Colony. Sometimes you see the colony of Saint-Souvier, pardon my French. Sometimes you see uh, Mount Desert Island Colony. All of them work. One is the name of the benefactor. One is the place name. And the other one is the island that the place name is on. <laughs> I know, that's confusing. The Madame sent over a large boat called the Jonas. Stocked with all sorts of provisions, everything you would need, including sailors, colonists, and, of course, the Jesuits who would be running the entire operation. All in all, about 50 people total. They intended to start a colony near the modern site of Bangor, Maine. But they were blown off course, as they often are in these stories, and they ended up on Mount Desert Island. Both of which are in the modern-day United States, in what we would consider New England but what they considered Acadia, part of New France. I told you New France was part of the other states of America. You didn't believe me, though, did you? That's because you have trust issues, and that's something you should work on. One of the very first things they did is they went to Port Royal to rescue those poor Jesuits that Bayancourt had essentially been uh, keeping as prisoners. And so Father Biard and his companion are now at the Madame's Colony. Keep that in mind. And so the colony would be run by the Jesuit René Le Loc de la Sauce. That's the best I can do. Don't give me crap for it. We're just going to call him Le Sauce because it sounds fun. The settlement would be quickly built by 80 men, 50 or so coming on the boat, as I previously mentioned, and the others shortly following in a smaller boat. 30 were planning to stay over winter. The very first thing they did, of course, was raise a large wooden cross right there where they landed. Their intentions being expressed. They were to bring the word of Jesus to a new land, a new people, people who had lived in ignorance of his grace. Soon afterward, the local Abenaki chief, of course, came around to see what exactly was happening here. His name was Chief Astiku. He quickly recognized the Jesuits were the equivalent of shamans to his people, and he asked them to heal the various sick in his community, including he himself. He then very cleverly used this ruse and this, this uh, appearance of need to get the Jesuits to build their little tiny colony very close to his summer quarters. As we've seen time and time again, one native group is always very eager to get these first Europeans close to them and under their control so that they could potentially use them as allies against their enemies. Despite the various stereotypes in history, Oftentimes, Europeans, when they first show up somewhere in North America, are not very threatening. Usually they're hungry, they're defenseless, they don't know where they are, they don't know how to grow food. But their weapons are interesting, and they bring exotic trade goods. And so, often the natives are eager to bring them as close to them as possible. And in this case, the Jesuits were very eager for, yes, at the Abenaki, you should move in with us. And so the colony actually became quite mixed. The uh, summer camp of the Abenaki, this particular band of them, and the Madam's Colony simply overlapped. Try to picture this arrangement for a minute. On the one end, you would have a colony that was essentially a monastery, where you had these Jesuits in charge, and everyone they brought with them, uh, ultra-Catholic, ultra-religious folks. What small government they had was a theocracy. They would say mass every morning, and the Jesuits would direct all the actions, all the directions, all the workflow of the few colonists they had. I think they may have been kind of hive-like in their nature. And then slowly as you moved away from this extreme end, you would start to see wigwams. The summer variety would be taller, more open, so that air can get in and out, keep everything nice and cool. Especially early on, perhaps some of the surplus French living in a wigwam with some Abenaki people. These Abenaki furthest in this direction were probably already in the process of being converted. They had taken to the French culture, the French wares, the French language, the French religion, the French ways, and they may have already received a Christian name. I imagine over time this would have caused some tension because the native cultures in this region certainly knew what the change of a name signified. It happened very often, more often than in European culture. 
among other things, changing one's name would have meant a change in roles in the society they're living in. Or in the case of captives in times of war, a change of name would mean you were adopted into an enemy tribe, and now you are essentially a different person with different allegiances. So perhaps there was some tension there. As we move further into the native portion of this combined community, we would find that the chief's wigwam was slightly larger. And it's quite likely that he placed it, instead of being in the center of where his people were staying for the summer, closer to the French end. This way he could be the conduit between his people and the French. He would essentially be in control. And then at the far end of the native settlement, you would find the shamans, the people in the Abenaki culture who would butt right up against the Jesuits. And then anyone under the sway of these shamans or anyone who would be xenophobic to the French. I could see conflict arising eventually, but that, that would never come about because we're in the year 1613. Now, as you know, we're seven years before the pilgrims land at Plymouth, right? Ah, but did you forget about Jamestown? Founded in 1607, fledgling, possible cannibalism, horrifying experience, massive deaths because they're basically living on a swamp. But by 1613, John Rolfe had planted tobacco, a specific variety that had just flourished all over Jamestown. And that was three or four years before the point in time we are now. Jamestown is beginning to grow. There was money to be made, opportunity everywhere. And so the governor of Virginia, which is essentially just Jamestown and the immediate vicinity, that would one day grow into places we know and love today, decided to use his man Samuel Argyll to troll straight up the coast north and remove any foreign outfits that might be present in what would surely be the English king's lands. Now, France and England were not at war at this time, but the governor of Virginia considered this all English territory, and so removing an interloper would not be an act of war. We saw a similar case in the uh, story of French Florida, which you should listen to, and I recorded earlier in the season. Now, Jamestown to Acadia, that's a long coastline with lots of nooks and crannies. Uh, Argyll could miss somebody, especially a small settlement, 50, 60 guys. He could possibly pass right over that and never notice it. But Argyll was a very skilled sailor and actually just very competent at everything he did. Morality aside, an accomplished man. And he got lucky in this case, hunting out the French. I'm going to turn to the illustrious historian Francis Parkman for this portion of our story. Samuel Argyll, trolling up the coast of Acadia. Thick fogs enveloped him, and when the weather cleared, he found himself not far from the Bay of Penobscot. Canoes came out from the shore. The Indians climbed the ship's sides, and as they gained the deck, greeted the astonished English with an odd pantomime of bows and flourishes, which in the belief of the latter could have been learned by none but the Frenchmen. Argyll assumed rightly that the natives were wrong in thinking that his men were also French. And so Argyll, pretending to be a Frenchman himself, implored the natives, please show me where my brothers are. And the Abenaki allies to the Madam's colony led the English right to them. Now Argyll had a ship called the Treasurer, which doesn't sound threatening at all. It had 14 cannons though, and it was staffed at this moment with 60 sailors ready to fight. The French knew the threat immediately, and many of them went scrambling to the Jonas. Before they could take their positions, Argyll gave them a quick broadside from his cannons. And the French were ordered to defend themselves and fire back at the treasurer. But only the lay brother would, being the only one to fire on the English. He received the full force of all the muskets. Death, mortally wounding him. Of course, having a slow, painful death. The English seized the Jonas. Then they stormed the shores and all the colonists in the Abenaki went scurrying off into the woods. This is when Argyll, again, very effective at what he, he does. He went into Le Cesse's personal effects, found all the paperwork from the madam and from the French government in general to legitimize their colony. He takes all that, 
and then puts everything back the way it was supposed to be. While this is going on, his men round them all up. And with all the Frenchmen now under their captivity, he says to Le Sauce, Listen, perhaps we're far enough north that this colony is legitimate. Maybe you're not interloping on English territory. All you have to do is show me some paperwork that says you're supposed to be here. Some land grants, something from the King of France, anything. Le Sauce, of course, goes running into his house. And as we know, the important paperwork is missing. And so Argyll says, you're pirates. You're interlopers. You don't belong here. You're, you're not legitimate by the eyes of the English king or the French king. We're, we're, we're taking everything. Now, some sources claim the Jesuits, having lost everything to the English in one swoop, then decided to get even with Biancourt. And they said to Argyll, hey, you know what? We're not the only French outfit out here. There's a little place called Port Royal you might want to check out. Argyll discovers the few little structures left on St. Croix, the first colony that Champlain participated in, burns all that to the ground. He goes to Port Royal, burns all that to the ground, scatters the Frenchmen, kills all the livestock. Now this might be small pickings. You're talking about dozens of guys, uh, overall less than 400 uh, Frenchmen and Englishmen in total. But this, this is cited as the beginning of the conflicts between the English and the French empires in North America, which will become quite epic. Argyll doing quite well for himself in Jamestown in the short term because of all the supplies, all the treasure they could get from the Jesuits. Well, that was his now. <laughs> Everything in Port Royal, well, that was his now. St. Croix, that was his now. Now you might say to yourself, well, how did, how did he take Port Royal without a fight? Well, buying core wasn't around at the time. Again, a lot of his bread and butter is collecting money from licenses. And so he arrives back at Port Royal while Argyll is still in the area. Biancourt tries a ruse to get Argyll out in the open. And of course, Argyll's a very smart man. He doesn't fall for it. Biancourt sees his entire settlement in ruin, smoking ruin, literally burnt to the ground. And he finally says to Argyll, hey, uh, I'll switch allegiances. How about I pledge allegiance to the English? And now suddenly, my Port Royal will be an English settlement. This betrayal of the French was, of course, recorded by Father Biard, who was in Argyll's capture and witnessing all this. Is he a non-partial observer? No. He hates Biancourt, so take that with a grain of salt. Oh, yeah. And Biancourt had one more provision for Argyll to switch allegiance. He said, you also got to hang Father Biard. Argyll said, no. The English don't want you. We don't trust you. And we don't want you here on the continent. So you got to go or live in the woods with the natives. Father Biard records that Biancourt then vomited against him every species of malignant abuse. Argyll stayed until November, uh, finding Biancourt to be absolutely destitute. No chance of him rebuilding, no possible threat to the English all the way down in Jamestown. He saw him in a sorry condition, but didn't feel enough pity on him to offer him any sort of ride back to what they considered civilization. And so simply left him and floated away. Four months later, in March of 1614, Poutron Corps arrives, by ship of course, to inspect what has happened to his son's colony. He finds Biancourt and his few followers who are left, including uh, Claude and Charles Latour, please keep those guys in mind, living in the ruins of Port Royal, many starving to death or chewing on tree roots. Poutron Corps said to his son, let's go, let's get out of here, we're done with this, this was a waste of time. It's it's just, it's too close to the English. There's no money in this. The Jesuits, got, they're poking their nose around. We got to get out of here. Biancourt refuses. He tells his dad, I'm staying right here. I see potential in the New World, in Acadia, for the French. Pouchencourt can't force his son to go with him. And so Biancourt stays in Acadia with a couple of his followers, a small party, and they essentially go native. They have to integrate with the Mi'kmaq and the Abenaki. And although small and meager and poor, they would maintain the on-the-ground French claim to Acadia for decades to come. Biancourt in his small circle would be the very first seed to French Acadia that would actually take root 
and not be stomped out. And we'll learn about that in an upcoming episode. But until then, this has been another episode of the Other States of America History Podcast. I'm Eric Giannis. Find us on Face Place and Twitter and YouTube and find us out there on the internet.com. Thank you for listening.